recent decades, women's participation in the workforce and higher education has increased substantially. In both the United States and the United Kingdom, more women than men go to university and women attain higher grades. Nonetheless, there continue to be striking gender differences in what men and women choose to study and in their career choices. For example, engineering classes have far more male than female students and psychology classes many more female than male students. Gender differences are particularly extreme at the highest levels of scientific achievement. For example, less than 3% of the Nobel laureates in the sciences are women, and no woman has ever won one of the top three awards in mathematics. Understanding why this is the case is essential for ensuring that men and women can fully participate in the jobs that keep a society based on science and technology running. We need to understand how we can design effective education that enables boys and girls to perform equally well when they leave school. The question about gender differences in school achievement, in particular in mathematics, is not new. Yet researchers continue to debate the extent and causes of the gender gaps in mathematics and related areas, including engineering. Some researchers claim that the gap in mathematics is being reduced through national policies focused on gender equality and gender empowerment. Our current study, analyzing data of 1.5 million 15-year-olds around the world, shows that this is not the case. We argue that in order to deal with the gender gaps, we need to look beyond gender equality policies and instead focus on learning and interests. In our study, published in the scientific journal PLOS ONE, we focused on four questions. Our first question was, how do 15-year-old boys and girls around the world perform in mathematics? We asked whether boys exceeded girls, as is the stereotype, whether there were changes from 2000 to 2009, and whether the mathematics gap varied from country to country. Our second question was how 15-year-old boys and girls around the world perform in reading, that is, how well do boys and girls do in text comprehension, something girls are generally known to be better at. Our third question was whether the gender gaps in mathematics and reading were related. And finally, we asked if national equality and gender empowerment policies help to reduce the gender gap in mathematics. How did we answer these questions? You might have heard of the PISA program. PISA stands for Program for International Student Assessment. It is a massive international study of the academic skills of 15-year-old children in mathematics, reading and science. It has been carried out in 75 different nations. And the age of 15 is useful for this type of study because this is the oldest age for which schooling is compulsory in many countries. The first PISA assessment was in 2000 and it has been conducted every three years since then. We analyzed the mathematics and reading achievement of the 1.5 million children that participated in the first four PISA assessments, that is in 2000, 2003, 2006 and 2009. I would like to give a little bit of a warning before I start talking about our findings. If I say that boys exceed in mathematics, or girls exceed boys in reading, we are talking about averages. This means that even when boys exceed girls on average, there will be outstanding girls and there will be poorly performing boys. When talking about averages, there is always the danger that people think that the findings apply to all boys and to all girls. That is not the case, because there is considerable variation within the groups of boys and girls. So what did we find? Let us talk about mathematics. Average across nations, boys exceeded girls, although the average gap is relatively small, but stable over the period we studied. But there is more than that. When looking at the data of the poorest performing students, we observed no difference between boys and girls. In other words, when we looked at who was struggling with mathematics, there were just as many boys as girls, despite boys doing better on average. In contrast, when we looked at who was excelling at mathematics, there were more boys than girls. The higher the mathematics performance, the bigger the gap. 
Among the 1% best students in mathematics, there were more than twice as many boys than girls. This is important because these high-performing students are the ones that will likely go into math-related university studies and careers in engineering and science. And finally, the mathematics gap varies between countries. In some countries, girls exceed boys, for example, in Albania, Lithuania, Malta and Qatar. Why and how this happens will be discussed later. Now let's turn to the reading data. Girls exceeded boys in reading. This gender gap seems to get less attention in the media than the gap in mathematics, but it is actually important for a number of reasons. First of all, we found that the average gap in reading is three times larger than the gap in mathematics. Second, it's highly consistent around the globe. There was not a single country in which boys exceeded girls in reading. And third, there was a moderate increase in the gap between 2000 and 2009. We found that the reading gap is particularly large among the poorest performing students. For example, in the 2009 PISA assessment there were more than six times as many boys as girls struggling with reading. At the high end of performance there were fewer boys than girls as well, but the difference was less extreme than at the low end. So far I have shown that boys exceed girls in mathematics and girls exceed boys in reading on average. Now I would like to show that these two gender gaps are actually related to one another. This is surprising because you would expect that because reading and mathematics are so different, boys' advantage in math would be unrelated to girls' advantage in reading. But that was not the case at all. In all four PISA assessments, we found that in countries with a relatively large gender difference in mathematics, there was a relatively small gender difference in reading. And the opposite was true as well. Countries with a relatively large gender difference in reading had a relatively small gender difference in mathematics. This inverse relation between mathematics and reading achievement is strong and stable over the decade we studied. In other words, in countries where the mathematics gap has been narrowed, the reading gap widens. In countries where the reading gap has been narrowed, the mathematics gap widens. This is really important when comparing countries. When policymakers use these data, they will often focus on either the mathematics or the reading gap. But it would make sense to look at both. Take for example Sweden. In the last PISA, unlike the United States or the United Kingdom, Sweden has no mathematics gap. But its reading gap was much larger than in the United States or the UK. Thus, while Sweden has managed to get rid of the mathematics gap, it has done very poorly in terms of the reading gap. Sweden is a good example of the inverse relation between the math and reading gap. It's important to note that no country has been able to escape the inverse relation between the two gaps. A final topic of our study is the relation between the gender gaps in 15-year-olds and the gender equality and gender empowerment status of countries. With gender equality and empowerment we mean things such as how women participate in the economy, the percentage of women in politics and women's health. These data are published by international organizations like the United Nations. A number of researchers claim that the gender gap in mathematics has become smaller over time and that this is directly related to the gender equality and gender empowerment situation of countries. At face value you might think that this would make a lot of sense. But when we did a thorough analysis using these data, we did simply not find this. If anything, economically developed nations with strong gender equality and human development scores tended to have a larger gender gap in mathematics. In summary, there are two distinct gender differences in school performance that affect very different groups of students, high achieving girls and low achieving boys. On the one hand, girls score lower in mathematics at the high end of performance and on the other hand, boys score lower in reading, in particular at the low end of performance. The mathematics gender gap continues to exist. It has not changed in the first decade of the 21st century. Gender equality and gender empowerment seem irrelevant for this gap. Our study implies that to reduce the mathematics gender gap, we need to focus on the higher achieving girls and we need to look beyond traditional equality issues. We need to invest in research in how other factors, such as learning mechanisms and interest differences, play a role. 
Addressing the reading gap affecting boys will likely require a very different approach. This because this gap is larger among the poorer performing students and because the gap is still growing. Altogether, our study helps to point out which segments of the student population to focus on and where more research is necessary. While some proposed solutions might make a lot of sense at face value, ranging from role models, gender empowerment and reducing stereotype threat, research does not seem to support these intuitive solutions. Instead, we believe that educational methods focusing on learning mechanisms and interests are far more likely going to make a real difference.